Corinthian church, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread, bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Today is the fifth week of our current series on gospel fluency. Week one, we spoke about what gospel fluency is. Week two, we spoke about why we need the gospel. Week three, we spoke about the gospel is my life. Week four, we spoke about the gospel around the table. Um, it's all on our YouTube channel. It's all on our podcast channel. So if you missed one of these, I really would like to encourage you to go and catch up. This series is an important series for us as we begin this year, wanting for God to renew us through the gospel. Today, our theme is the gospel with us. Now, the plural is very, very important here. Everything that I'm saying today, I'm talking about we, not me. Our scripture reading comes from the book of Acts. Acts is the origin story of the church. How did the church come into being? And then, obviously, what did the church do? How did the good news spread? And how did the disciples of Jesus, the apostles, which was his followers when he was on earth, how did they keep on spreading good news and sharing the good news and seeing the kingdom being ushered into this world, right? That's Acts. Now, if you look at Acts, you'll see diet and you'll see exercise. Let me show you a picture, some healthy food. Let's just get the imagination going here. I mean, that's very healthy. Do you know what I mean? And then let me show you a picture of exercise, just to get the imagination going. There we go. Most of us said diet and exercise is the way that we keep healthy. Diet and exercise takes devotion from you. Okay? It takes commitment from you. And in the story of Acts, we see what the church devoted themselves to. Let me show you a picture of myself. This is me on a bicycle. Now, if you haven't known me for long, you'll go, oh, that's Reino on a bicycle. But if you've known me for long, you'll go, what? Reino on a bicycle? That's really odd, because I'm actually a runner. And by God's grace, I'll be running the Comrades Marathon again this year. In 2021, my dad said to me, listen, I've got a team entry for a race called the trans Bavians Mountain Bike Race. We are going to do it in a team of two. The entry is paid for. Um, do you want to come and do it with me? Now, there wasn't a comrade scheduled for that year. We were still back in the pandemic, so I decided to do it. Do you guys know what was interesting about my Transbavian's journey? Is it literally changed my whole life. Not because it was enjoyable, but because I literally had to turn from being a runner to being a cyclist. Which meant I wore new kit, which meant I needed new equipment, which meant I joined a new community, which meant I had to learn a new language, which meant I had to uh, uh, alter my diet, which meant I had to alter my exercise regime, which means I had to uh, change my weak rhythm. It literally changed everything. It took me to commit to something new and to take on that diet and to take on that exercise and to take on that identity to be successful in this race. And then I had to actually get on the bicycle and pedal it. It took me five and a half thousand kilometers to prepare for this race. At that moment, it was just after 6.30 in the morning. It was one degree. My dad and I started at 4.52 in minus four. And that's my dad right at the back. They're not shaming him at all. He's a little bit uh, better in downhills and I'm a little bit better in the uphills. But it asked for devotion from me. I had to commit to doing the same thing over and over and over. In the book of Acts, we see that the Gospels devoted themselves, not the Gospels, the uh, disciples, the church, the followers of Jesus, they devoted themselves to something. 
Now, devotion doesn't mean reading your Bible and praying in the morning, right? We often use it that way. Have you done your devotions? How is your devotions going? Devotion actually means being committed to doing the same thing over and over because you know that it will yield some benefits. Simple example, brushing your teeth. You need to commit to it. And you need to commit to it hopefully twice a day. And you commit to it by doing it over and over because you actually do believe that it will be great for your dental health. Do you guys know what I mean? None of you, well I hope, none of you skipped this morning because that's just one of the things that you do naturally, right? You have to get to this. The cycling metaphor was I had to get up and I actually had to get on the bicycle and I had to do my training ride. The stuff that you are uh, devoted to shows what is important to you. Why? Because that's the things that we prioritize, it's the things that we repeat, and it's the things that we keep on doing because we believe that it's actually good to us. Question. Do you know what the church of Jesus is devoted to? Do you know what the Christian is devoted to? If you are a believer, I really do hope that you know. And if you're a non-believer, I don't expect of you to know, but I do want you to at least look at what the church is supposed to be devoted to, and then if you still choose to reject the good news and not be part of the church, then at least just reject the real thing. Because this passage in the book of Acts and the book of Acts actually show us what the church is supposed to be devoted to. So the teaching text of today is a snapshot of the diet and exercise of the early church. Let me show you. So the highlighted words in red is what they devoted themselves to. And then the highlights in green is explanations of how they did it. Right? So it's like diet and exercise. This is what they ate and this is what they did while eating this. Okay, this slide will be up as I continue to preach, so you don't have to take a photo of now or memorize all the red and greens. If we take these verses and we pass out what the church devoted themselves to, we actually see ten things. Let me show them to you. Now, I'm not going to preach a ten-point sermon, just warning, okay? But these ten things we see in these few verses. Devotion to the Word, Devotion to one another. I've got a scripture reference on there every single time. This is maybe a good slide to take a photo of. I won't show it again. Devotion to the Lord's Supper. Devotion to prayer. Radical sharing and mercy ministry, especially within the church. Constant interaction with one another. Gathering in both large and small groups. A spirit of all gladness and praise to God. An attractive faith and everyday evangelism. That's what the church is devoted to. That's what it was devoted to. That's what it still is devoted to today. And that's what it will be devoted to in the future. Do you know this? And not only do you know this, are you devoted to this yourself as a Christian? Because this will make us fluent in the gospel. Okay, now, I couldn't do a 10-point sermon. That would keep us here for two hours. So I'm going to do a four-point one. Okay. Okay. With a question, what do we need to be fluent in the gospel? Remember, gospel fluency means knowing what the gospel means for every aspect of your life without having to think about it. It's like speaking a language that you are fluent in. And we feel like in the beginning of the year, we have to pause and speak about our own gospel fluency. So there you go. How do we attain gospel fluency? By biblical nourishment, loving fellowship, vibrant worship, and word and deed outreach. I'm going to do a prayer for us now. Before I do that, may I ask you to posture your heart for some really hard questions. I am going to press in very deep today. Not because I feel like I want to judge or rebuke you, but because I feel that is what the Spirit laid on my heart. So if you are going to fight with me, you won't be able to hear the word. So posture yourself to go, okay, Lord Jesus, I am one of your followers. I've confessed it with my mouth. Your word is going to speak to me now, so speak to me. Let's pray. Father God, as we open up your word, we are glad that we can and that we have the opportunity to do so. We are also open for you to do in us whatever that is. We know that you want to form us into the image of your son. We know that you want to bring fruit uh, uh, forth in our lives. 
We know that you want to um, make us new and redeem us. We know that you want to give us life and life in abundance. We know it is your will that we would know you and your word better. So, Father God, in light of all of that, I pray that you would do exactly that as we continue to study your word together. You are our Father, we are your children, and we are keen to listen to you. So speak to us. We pray that in your name. Amen. Okay. How do we attain gospel fluency? First one, biblical nourishment. You'll see that they devoted themselves in red to the apostles' teaching. Now, it's important for us to understand what the apostles' teaching is. They gathered, we see that in verse 46, they gathered in the temple courts because of the size of the group. They also gathered in homes in smaller groups. Why did they gather? They gathered, listen, to absorb and hear teaching. They didn't only gather for a good time. They did gather for a good time, but not only for a good time. There was something that they needed to learn. This was a learning community. And they were devoted to becoming learners. That's actually the root of the word disciple, is learner. Are you a learner? Why does this get mentioned first? Well, because what they are learning is about who they are worshipping. Do you guys see that? So we worship God, the creator and the sustainer of everything, who became a human in Jesus Christ, who died for our sins and who was raised from the dead. Okay, cool. Tell me more about him. Because I want to worship Him and I want to be in a relationship with Him, but I need to know who He is and then also who I am and what that means for my life. If you just rewind a little bit in, the, uh, in Acts chapter 2, you'll see in Acts chapter 2 verse 14, Peter got up and Peter started preaching. What did he do? He told the story of the Old Testament. He told the story of the birth, life, death, resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ and then he gave the opportunity for people to accept that as the truth and to become a new human that's what Peter did so Peter was telling them about who they are worshiping and may I just remind you once again that we worship a loving gracious merciful forgiving ever-present ever-knowing all-knowing, almighty, never-changing God. That is who we're worshipping. And Peter then tells them about that story and then says that this God, after the sin of humanity, has always pursued humanity, has always wanted to teach humanity how to live in a relationship with Him. Humanity has always got it wrong and no single animal sacrifice, even though it's done repetitively, could pay for human sins. So God decided to sort it out Himself. And He got involved. He became a human being. He dwelt among us. He eventually laid down His life. By His blood we are covered for our sins. He made atonement for our sins. And not only that, he was also raised from the dead, defeated sin and evil, and then ascended to heaven so that he could pour out his spirit in us. And now he lives in all of us as his temples. Isn't that just the best news ever? You can also have it. That's exactly what Peter told them. That's the gospel. Okay. The apostles' teaching is something different. The gospel is the announcement of the good news of Jesus. The apostles' teaching is that which helps us to explore the manifold implications of this announcement. Remember, the people in this portion of Scripture didn't have the New Testament yet. The New Testament was still being written. So the apostles had the task of, uh, of teaching them what this announcement means for their lives. Because the actual apostles is still alive in this part of the story. So just imagine this. People sitting around in a teaching environment and the apostles saying, Okay guys, so this is what he said to us. I was there. This is what he did. We saw it with our own eyes. And this is what he commanded us to do. And that's what I'm doing now and that is what you should do yourself. I think a simple way to ask it is, what does it mean to live as if the gospel is true? That's what the apostles taught the people. Jesus, as the risen Lord, alive now, what does that mean? Now, for you and I, the apostles' teaching come in the form of the New Testament. The New Testament teaches us what it means to live as followers of Jesus. And fam, it takes a lifetime to learn this. It takes a lifetime for this good news to seep into every part of our lives. That's why it requires, listen, a daily devotion to it. 
Strap yourself in. Hard questions. Do you understand the gospel? And do you proclaim it? What are you currently consuming? What are you reading? What are you listening to on your commute? What kind of media are you exposed to? Are you sitting under the word regularly and humbly? Are brothers and sisters admonishing you to do this? Are you submitting to hard truth and repenting if you hear hard truth? Are you being renewed in the gospel daily? Are you teaching the Bible to anyone? And let me just say, fam, if you're a parent, at the very least, you should be teaching the gospel to your kids. At the very least. For us to be fluent in the gospel, we need biblical nourishment. And let me encourage you by saying that this is the best time ever to actually start reading your Bible because we've got a gazillion resources to do it. And we've got a gazillion ways to do it. Fam, we say we won't be able to do it without even trying. And I think I should call all of us out on that one. We dismiss changes in our diet and exercise before we have actually tried it. Just try it. Take the word and read it. Or subscribe to a reading plan. Or read with your spouse. Do it. The time is now. You'll never become fluent in the gospel if you don't know this beautiful book. I promise you that. Second thing we need to be fluent in the gospel, loving fellowship. The Greek word for fellowship is koinonia. Koinonia not only means sharing with one another, it means being committed to sharing everything with others. Fam, if we want to have loving fellowship as a church, we need to move from proximity to one another to compassion for one another. I promise you now, you won't have loving fellowship in this church if you only come here on a Sunday and you sit next to someone. You need to turn to someone. You need to look them in the eye. Sawubona. And you need to listen to them and absorb a part of their story and then you need to share some of your story in return. In that way, we have loving fellowship. In that way, us versus them becomes just us. And as a transcultural church with so many man-made boundaries and differences between us, we dream of this. We dream of this community transcending all man-made boundaries and becoming one new community in Christ. Can you guys imagine in our country at this time what a powerful testimony this church can have if we actually have loving fellowship with one another? It takes time. It takes intentionality. It is difficult. And let me just say it outright, the pandemic made us unbelievably lazy and very selfish. And that is the truth. I can actually quote stats if you need me to. Because we were in isolation for so long, and we only looked after ourselves for so long, we haven't shaken off the cobwebs of the pandemic and actually approached people again, got people around our tables, and learned how to listen again. The worst thing that could happen to us in the pandemic is you can join an online meeting, mute your camera, mute your mic, and not listen. That, that means that we've missed, we, we don't flex the listening muscle anymore. Actually, this is not in my notes, but let me give you some homework. When you go home today, try and think of just five people who listen really well. I challenge you. I don't think you'll find five. Because we live in a world where everyone speaks, but no one listens. We need to listen to one another if we want to have loving fellowship. Every church in this world, including Fellowship City, has ninja members. You pull in 20 minutes late, you pull out 10 minutes early, really fast. No one ever knows you or sees you. 
You cannot have loving fellowship if you're a ninja member. And also, if you're a ninja member and you then say the church doesn't know anything of me and doesn't love me, then how on earth should we if you pull in and pull out like a ninja? You can't say that no one in the church ever reached out to you if you haven't reached out to anyone. A handshake goes both ways, guys. One arm from this side and one arm from the other side. Not only did they have loving fellowship, but they actually broke bread. Breaking bread isn't a metaphor. Breaking bread means taking bread and breaking it and eating it. They had food together. And while they had food together, they shared of themselves. They opened up their lives to one another. And in this setting, they did communion. That's what makes eating together so beautiful is as we sit around the table, as we get to know each other, as we look each other in the eye, as we share something of ourselves, then we say, then let us be reminded of the fact that Jesus' body was broken for us and that his blood was poured out for us. And because of this, there's forgiveness of sins and it's because of, because of this that you and I can sit around this table. Isn't it just phenomenal? And they joyfully Eight. Look at it. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. In verse 47. I'll get there now. Loving fellowship. Hard questions. Do you have fellowship with God through Jesus? Because if you can't have fellowship with your creator, I promise you now you won't have fellowship with people. That's where it starts. Are you working at building community with others? Is your dream community hindering you from really experiencing genuine community? This is one of the worst excuses Christian, Christians make. Look, look, look. I am really committed to community, but this community really sucks, you know. I would like a better one. If I find a better one, I will be in it. This one, difficult, hard. I don't like it. The people suck. They come late. Their kids are noisy. I don't like them. You're never going to experience real community if you're dreaming of a perfect community. Because let me tell you, you also annoy some people. That's a hard truth now, isn't it? All these people who annoy me. Do you know that these people who I annoy? Do you love the idea of community more than the actual community? Are you complaining about the community rather than loving the community? Do you show up to events and meetings faithfully? I think that's a legitimate question. Are you involved in one another's lives throughout the week? Or are we Sunday mates? Are you sensitive to the needs of your brothers and sisters? Are you grateful for your brothers and sisters? And have you actually told them that? Thank you for being my brother. And thank you for being my sister. I'm very encouraged by you. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German theologian, said, The physical presence of other Christians is a source of incomparable joy and strength to the believer. Do you believe that? Or do you think you're good on your own? So we need biblical nourishment. We need loving fellowship to be gospel fluent. Third one, we need vibrant worship. Look at it. They devoted themselves to prayer. In the Greek it says to the prayers. Now we need to double click that quickly. At this moment, at this point in time, the church in Acts is almost still entirely a Jewish community. That means that they have a 2,000-year-old tradition of praying, which means that they pray at specific times, and they pray specific prayers throughout the day, and they cycle through that rhythm day after day after day. Part of that rhythm is cycling through praying the Psalms, cycling through praying the, uh, 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 the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught them. And when they did this, they did what? They gathered for worship. And when they gathered for worship, it was vibrant. There was something to see in it. They were actually enjoying it. One of the questions that I'm faced with often is, am I enjoying prayer? 
Is my posture towards prayer that I get to do this? And does it fill me with awe and with joy? I've used this metaphor before, but let me use it again. Can you guys imagine what my marriage would look like if I looked at my wife in the morning and I said to her, listen, I'm supposed to kiss you and I'm supposed to hug you and I'm supposed to tell you that I love you. So here we go. I love you. Kiss, hug, boom. I'm done now. Because I have to do it. Can you guys imagine what my marriage would be like? No, 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 fam. No, no. I behold my wife. And then I say, I get to kiss you. Do you know what I mean? And I get to hug you. And I get to tell you that I love you. And it's a privilege. Also, after 11 years of marriage. There's an enjoyment in this relationship. I don't do it out of duty. Christians are supposed to worship in a way that when people see us, they actually see us enjoying it. So even this morning in both prayers that were offered and in what somebody did for us, if someone stood at the door who knew nothing about Christians, what they were supposed to see is, wow, these people are really enjoying what they're doing. I'm interested. Because it seems like they're doing a group karaoke. But group karaoke is never that fun. So what are they doing here? It seems really enjoyable. It's part of our testimony that when we gather, we gather in vibrant worship. We dream of our worship and praise in this church being vibrant because that's actually part of sharing the good news. Do you know that someone can come to Christ by merely seeing how Christians interact with one another and then asking, how can I be part of this? And then you say, Jesus, right? Put your faith in Jesus and you are in. You might be a growing Christian. You might not understand or know vibrant worship that well. My only encouragement to you would be just keep on repeating these habits. Like keep on doing what you're supposed to be doing and you will grow in your awe, your understanding and your joy of your own faith. These things should remake our minds. It should remake our lives. And our minds and our lives will become a response of worship and gratefulness to Jesus. Josie said earlier, one of the ways that she keeps healthy is watching what she's thinking. You see, if you enter vibrant worship, and you enjoy prayer, and you enjoy fellowship with God, it changes here, and it changes here, and it changes here. For those listening to the podcast, I showed head, heart, and hands. It's really, really important for us to understand that this would remake our lives. That's why we need to do it, and that's why we need to be devoted to it. Hard questions. Are you praising God with other brothers and sisters in large and small gatherings? Do you often come to the Lord's table? And how do you come to the Lord's table? Are you experiencing awe and joy? Are you praying with other brothers and sisters? Are you grateful for the privilege of gathering corporately? Another Bonhoeffer quote, It is by the grace of God that a congregation is permitted to gather visibly in this world to share God's word and sacrament. Hey. This guy was executed by the Third Reich and the Nazi regime. This guy knew how important this was. He couldn't do it as freely as we do it today. So we should hear his words. Vibrant worship. Last one. What do we, uh, how do we attain gospel fluency? Well, through word and deed outreach. Spirit-empowered witness, right? This is what the church does in the book of Acts and what the church does today. Spirit-empowered witness happens through word and with deed. Let me show you. By word, it creates and brings into being this new community, right? So we proclaim the gospel, people believe the gospel, and through their belief and faith in the gospel, this new community comes into being. So word is very, very, very important. But so is deed. Because through our deeds, our common life together as Christians reinforces this word. And it becomes in itself an effective witness. Do you guys see that? Jesus loves you with my mouth. And then Jesus loves you with my hands. Double whammy. Like how on earth can you argue with that? Because I said and I also did. 
Okay, that's an easy one. Showing someone love. How about forgiveness? That's a hard one, isn't it? I say that God forgave my sins and yours. I say that I need to forgive you and you need to forgive me. But then I need to do it. And we need to forgive one another, showing that in our deeds. There is a part to word and deed outreach that says, come and see. And I think come and see in a country like South Africa is an effective way to do evangelism. I really do. Which means that whatever we do as church, you can always invite people to it. From city group, to worship services, to men's ministry, to prayer journeys, whatever it is that we do in ministry, you can always invite people and say to them, come and see, come and see, I want to show you. Join me in this. The invitation is open. Please do that. And, listen, not but, and please also go and tell. That's really important, guys. We can't only rely on come and see for evangelism. We also need to go and tell. Every week, we send a message to you saying, please pray about someone you can invite here. If you've invited the same person six times and they haven't come, then go and tell. That's the only other response we have. We can keep on inviting them, that's fine. But at some point, we have to go and tell, and we have to show compassion to people inside and outside. So invite that person over for dinner then, if they don't want to come to a Sunday service. It's not that difficult. And if you're not a dinner type of person, then go lunch. If you're not a lunch type of person, go breaky. If you're not a breaky kind of person, go snacky. Whatever it is, just go and tell someone so that they know. Only two questions left. Well, this is four, two. One on the word side, are you practicing evangelism? Because if you're not, you are disobedient to the Great Commission. Period. The Great Commission is not the Great Suggestion. The Great Commission is the single most important command Jesus ever gave His church. Go! Go! And do what I already did. That's my short paraphrase or trans, uh, um, translation today. And then indeed, how are you showing compassion and generosity both inside and outside the church? I think that's a question that we need to sit with. Because through word and deed outreach, we become fluent in the gospel. Let me land with this. What I just told you now shouldn't be new to you. Fam, this is basics, to be honest. And one thing that we all know about a successful organization, person, or family, is they do the basics well. Back to my mountain bike race that I did. I didn't have to train too technical for downhills. I didn't have to train too technical for uphills. I didn't have to do any out of the ordinary training. But I had to sit on the bicycle for five and a half thousand kilometers to be ready for that race. Basics. And I did it well and my race went well. Basics in anything you do, if you do it well, you will see the fruit of it. For us as Christians... These four things, actually ten things, but then condensed into four. These are the things that we should be devoted to. We should be committed to doing it always, repetitively, and we should be committed to do it well. And let me tell you, I'm not a prophet by gifting, but we will see revival when we devote ourselves to these things, and the Spirit will do it in a significant way. It's really important, guys, to understand that revival and renewal is not God doing extraordinary things. Revival or renewal is God doing what He has always done, just in an extraordinary way. And I promise you that if we devote ourselves to this, and we declutter everything else that we devote ourselves to, we will see revival and renewal. Last Borneo for quote. It is grace, 
nothing but grace that we are allowed to live in community with Christian brothers and sisters. I'm going to read that one again. It is grace, nothing but grace, that we are allowed to live in community with Christian brothers and sisters. San Marie, I would like to invite you to take your seat behind the piano. Just before San Marie starts leading us in a response song, let's land here and let me just give you some time to reflect on the four ways in which we attain gospel fluency. Biblical nourishment, loving fellowship, vibrant worship, word and deed outreach. And let me just give you some time to reflect on the hard, visceral, honest questions I asked us. And I want you to just take some time to consider what is it that's resonating with you and how is God busy dealing with you? Where are your devotions aligned to those of the church in the New Testament? And where are your devotions misaligned? And then, fam, hear the truth and repent and change. <laughs> and get back to a devotion to the things that will help us to grow and attain gospel fluency. Last thing that I want to say. At the center of all of this is Jesus. If you take the book of Acts and you take these practices and these descriptions of the church and you take the word Jesus out, it'll all fall flat. Because nothing is more powerful or more compelling to people's devotion than that which really matters in the heart. So this isn't a social club. This isn't like-minded folk. This isn't a monocultural group. These are all people who believe the same thing. And that's going to be the words of our response song as well. We're going to pray and ask and contend for Jesus to be at the center of everything we do so that we can truly see the gospel with us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we want to devote ourselves anew this morning to biblical nourishment, to loving fellowship, to vibrant worship, and to word and deed outreach. And Lord Jesus, we want to we wanna give ourselves to the work and the commission of the church. And we want you to do the ordinary things that you've always done in an extraordinary way in this time. I pray that we would hunger for the word. I pray that nothing that we watch or read that is not the word will satisfy us. And I pray when we read the word that it will truly be as sweet as honey in our mouths, as the psalm writer says. That it would be a lamp unto our feet. That we would see the world more clearly because it is rooted, our reality is rooted in your word. Lord Jesus, help us to ruthlessly and courageously just weed out everything that steals our time. Mindless scrolling and mindless binge watching and mindless gossip and mindless everything else we do. Please liberate us from that. Help us to commit to loving fellowship. Lord Jesus, it fills me with awe and wonder to, to, to just believe that someone else who I might not even know their name can be my brother and sister can be equally yoked with me, can journey with me, can care for me and can love me because of your blood that binds us together. Please make us a fellowship of compassion and of commitment to one another. Please um, de-shackle us from this belief that we are okay on our own and that we can just muscle through life on our own means. And Lord Jesus, when we worship and when we pray, I ask you that it would be enjoyable to us. Please have us stand once again in awe and in wonder that we get to worship you, the creator and the sustainer of everything. Have us stand in awe of the fact that you know the amount of hair we have on our heads. Have us stand in awe about the fact that you chose to die for us, knowing full well every sin that we, will ever, uh, that we were ever going to commit. And Father God, give us a, a, a passion and an opportunity for word and deed outreach. May we speak the truth, may we speak the gospel, may we do it all in love, and may we show it by our deeds. 
I know, Lord Jesus, that this is your church. And you will build your church. And you said that the gates of Hades will not prevail against the church. So as we take this commission seriously, Lord Jesus, may we be fully dependent on your spirit and by what it is that you do inside of us. I pray that you would revive us and that you would renew us. Lord Jesus, we put you at the center of it all. We pray that in your name. Amen.